At Kroger, we want our fresh produce to meet your expectations, which is why we're dedicated to doing up to a 27-point inspection on our fruits and veggies, checking for things like scarring. In fact, only the best produce like zesty oranges and crisp carrots reach our shelves. Because when it comes to fresh, our higher standards mean fresher produce. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Save big on your favorites with the buy five or more, save a dollar each sale. Simply buy five or more participating items and save a dollar each with your card. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Hey everyone, I'm Matt Lieb. And I'm Vince Mancini. And this is Pod, Pod Yourself a Gun. Gun. hates when I do it. I the same hate time. it. Uh, it is a Sopranos podcast where Vince and I go through every single episode of The Sopranos and break it down. You know, we just like to get in just just every nook just and let cranny. Just tenderize mm-hmm. like a fine meat. Yeah, we like to tenderize lemon that meat. juice. Hell yeah, dude. And today our guest is, if you are a listener of our normal podcast, the Film Drunk Frogcast, you know him, you love him. It's Justin Halpern. Hey, guys. How you hey. doing? I'm very excited to be you on your other podcast. You didn't even give any of his credits, though. You know, he you, did. He said I had been a guest on the other guest podcast. On the, <laughs> the one uh, important credit. Yeah. That's yeah. a big credit. Also, yeah. no, uh, you, you know to... him, you love him. Yeah. That, okay, sure. I felt represented. I, I, there yeah, was I, no part of me that, that felt like I wasn't properly introduced. You felt seen. I did. I yeah. felt, I felt I seen. I see you, dude. But you got yeah. to like list his TV bona fides. We're not just some fly-by-night podcast. We get like people that are actually you know, producing shows and shit. All right, but I don't want to fuck it up because I introduced Neil Brennan at a comedy show uh, last week. And I introed him as a writer for The Chappelle Show. And mm, he co-creator. Went, uh, yeah, he, well, he went up and just said, uh, creator of the Chappelle show. And I felt like a jerk. Yeah. So I don't want to, like, fuck this up. But uh, you, I also co-created the Chappelle show. You, yeah, you know him <laughs> from the Chappelle show. You know him for, as a creator of so many TV shows. Uh, we got Roseanne, uh, <laughs> the Sopranos. Uh, the creator of the Sopranos is here. Uh, yeah, all sorts of shows, dude. Um, I mean, I can't. I'm not gonna list Shit them. My dad says, says, Shit, my surviving dad says, Jack, surviving Jack, and the upcoming uh, Harley, Harley Quinn, Quinn animated. There show. you go. Yeah. Like I yeah. said, I can't do credits because I, 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 I freak out and then I just, I just how about say you, Roseanne. Ha, how about this is your job to play the theme song? All right. Pod. 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 Podcast. Pod. 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 Podcast. Yeah, you, every, a theme song has to get everybody in the mood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It gets people pumped. Uh, How and... am I going to get that out of my head? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is episode seven, Down Neck. It aired uh, February 21st, 1999. Mm-hmm. Uh, February 21st, actually my birthday. Don't use that to steal my identity. Uh, well, af- we're halfway there. <laughs> After stealing the sacramental wine from the school chapel, Anthony Jr. is suspended. Tony is concerned that his bad influence is responsible for his son's behavior and has a series of disturbing flashbacks in which he remembers learning that his own father was in the mob. Yeah. Uh, let's start, I think, with the Wayback Machine, because I want to know what was going on February 21st. What was happening back then? 1999. Yeah. Uh, well, it was Roger Clemens' first workout with the Yankees. Okay. They were the defending World Series champs, and he just you know got on his, got on his little mound, throwing his little balls. Uh <laughs> Posh Spice and David Beckham uh, had just decided to name their child Brooklyn after the place where he was conceived. Oh, gross. She was 24 and he was 23 at the time. Damn, really? I did not realize they were so young at the time. They were babies. Yeah. Uh, Gene Siskel had died uh, the previous day. The headline was that Gene Siskel was dead at 53, complications from his second brain cancer surgery. Damn, R.I.P. His final film review uh, was the Freddie Prinze Jr. romantic comedy "She's All That"? What did he think? Which it's not he gave a bad a, one to go out on. He gave a favorable review. Do you want me? To, you want to read some of that? Sure. Uh, our flick of the week is "She's All That," a high school drama that accurately reflects the intense pressures that seventeen-year-olds feel about their senior prom, <laughs> from whom they are going with to what directions their lives will take afterward. 
The extra gimmick here is a makeover bet that the studly prom king hopeful, Freddie Prinze Jr., mm-hmm. makes with his friends. He claims he can transform a geeky artistic girl, Rachel Lee Cook, into the prom queen. Yeah. That, Long, yeah. That I think that movie like started the makeover trope in oh i think it was you it, think it was before that no because oh, yeah. can't, buy me love can't buy me love was yeah, basically yeah. a bet oh, yeah. except it was the, yeah. the reverse right it was patrick dempsey yeah. being unnerded yeah the, you know what that girl's name was in that movie what jennifer mancini Whoa. really yep i, I think it was jennifer her last name was mancini yeah mancini is wow. all over film history I mean, other than The Godfather? I don't think so. Well, that's two. Yeah, that's And true. then Henry Mancini. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. Wrote the Pink Panther Name thing. one one character in film history with the last name Lieb. You can't. Yeah, they probably changed it to like... Yeah, I know. Something. I Everyone... bet there's an accountant in some movie that's <laughs> named Lieb. There probably is. And you know what? I, if someone could point that out, just uh, send an email to frogcast at gmail.com. I want to know the one character named Lieb. Vince uh, gets all the characters. Speaking of names, most popular boys' names in 1999, <laughs> Jacob, Michael, Matthew, Joshua, Nicholas, Christopher, Andrew. Uh, for girls, Hannah, Man. <laughs> Alexis, Sarah, Samantha, Ashley, Madison, and Taylor. You, you Ashley want... Madison. Yeah, there you oh, go. Shit. Right next to each other. And mm. then, so, uh, also there was a lot of uh, headlines from the New York Post. They were really mean to Monica Lewinsky, not yeah. surprisingly. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So that they, that's one of like the big time capsule moments I think where you really see the difference in eras is how, how Monica covered. Lewinsky was treated. Oh my god. Yeah. Um so there was two headlines she actually appeared on Barbara Walters uh the two headlines uh perky Monica unzips her lips for baba. Jesus and Christ. And then and this next one's even worse. Monica blows into town for Oof. Walters chat. God damn. Uh let me let me read some of that. A perky Monica Lewinsky hunkered down with Barbara Walters yesterday for her first TV interview. Hunkered down? Like, they're they're doing all sorts of... They're fat <laughs> like, shaming, slut shaming. Also, these are just, like, such, like, blatant puns. It's like, Monica <laughs> on Walters doesn't suck dick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, they're not even trying no, to. Yeah. It's the post. Yeah. Uh, the sex gate siren wore her standard New York garb, a black dress hidden behind a black trench coat and a Yankees cap. But she had a California attitude, mm. sources said. What the fuck does that mean? I don't know. She was real perky. She looked pretty good, said one stagehand. The, you can't even name the stagehand. It's great. Uh, she was smiling. She seemed in a real good mood. And then here's another great sentence. The chunky former intern Man. ate lunch. Oh, my God. Wow. Fucking A, these people. Coffee and Danish for breakfast and a turkey sandwich they for just, lunch. <laughs> they just listened to what she ate? Yep. Man. So, uh, unsurprisingly, there was, <laughs> there was no cum. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, she wore a dress that didn't even have cum on. Yeah, I, like uh, really, back in the day, we just—I uh, mean, not even that far back in the day. No, we just decided that this uh, blatant case of workplace harassment was her fault. Yeah, yeah. where the president had an intern <laughs> blow him, and we blamed the intern. <laughs> we victim blamed and slut yeah. shamed at the same time. Yeah, the intern. Uh, damn, dude. Instead of the president. Of the <laughs> Uh, uh, it was also the debut of Office Space. The weekend oh, debut wow. opened in eighth place, mm-hmm. earned four point two million. Uh, Payback was the number one movie. Top pop Still. song was "Angel of Mine" by Monica, and uh, the top again ro- the top rock song was "Heavy" by Collective Soul. <laughs> This feels like it would be in like a, a scene at the bank, you know? Yeah, oh for sure. Yeah. Very 90s. This is I didn't even know that Collective Soul had another hit. What was the other hit? Dun dun na 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 we're gonna let, let our, our light, light, light shine. shine, shine right? down. Whatever. Very mm-hmm. good. Yeah. Very good. I tried. Speaking of heaven, which I think was the segue you were trying to make, uh, this episode down neck opens up with uh, AJ Anthony Jr. stealing the sacramental wine with his uh, with his buddies and mm-hmm. getting drunk and vomiting, yeah. which is kind of 
in terms of Bada B stories, leads us into, I think, this entire episode. Because this is, like, one of the few episodes that kind of sticks with, um, like, a single storyline, at least for the most part. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, yeah. So, in terms of Bada B stories, we'll get into it. Also, we need a bumper for Bada B stories. AJ steals the sacrament. Tony is worried that he is adversely influencing his son. Um, and also, uh, AJ is forced to visit Olivia Soprano in her nursing home mm-hmm. and accidentally reveals that Tony is going into therapy. Yeah. Um, a little bit of trivia about this episode. It's the only episode of The Sopranos directed by a woman. Which, really? Which is, you said, I saw somebody said that to us on Twitter, and that's insane. And just also such a, again, of an era <laughs> yeah. Yeah. that really didn't end that long ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where... No one cared if you ever had anyone but a white dude no. yeah. behind the camera yeah. in front of it. Well, didn't no one, matter. Like no one was IMD being the right. episode to see. Like the director of a Sopranos episode was not a thing that anyone was paying attention to. No, and and it's really it's crazy too because like I remember when I first started in the TV business, and I was on writing staffs. I was on a staff one time that was thir- fourteen dudes and one woman, uh-huh. <laughs> and the show was. How many of them went to Harvard? Uh, uh, <laughs> two, oh, okay. two of fourteen. Uh, it was it, it was the show was terrible, but like also your show is going to be terrible if your writing staff is fourteen dudes and one woman. Like, right. Yeah. It's all going to sound the same and be shitty. It's sort of like how, uh, how like you know how you really shouldn't count baseball stats when they happened before black players <laughs> right. were in the league. <laughs> exactly. Like. TV shows could have been so much better so much earlier if they had just made an effort to like yeah. have other people in the writer's room. Because yeah. you can like see, it's not just like, like oh, it, like TV shows should be diverse because you should be, get, it's like, also the show is way better when right. you have different people in a writer's You're room. Like, oh, no one knew how to write for that character. Yeah, exactly. And like, I, I think it's it's just, it, it's such a sign of the times uh, those times that th- this was the only <laughs> Sopranos episode directed by a woman. That's yeah. fucking crazy. Yeah. And uh, other trivia, it was uh, Michael B. Jordan has a cameo. I, I know. I think it's his first acting credit. Really? Yeah. He tells... He plays at, Apollo Creed. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Young Apollo Creed. Yeah. No, he actually yells at young Tony for dropping his candy wrapper. For um, littering. Yeah, for littering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In a... Uh, in well, a... I didn't even realize. I didn't recognize him. Yeah. I didn't recognize him at first either until mm-hmm. I looked at the credits for the episode. Yeah, I saw and I was like, you know, first it was that character, then it was Wallace, and then it was uh, fucking history from there. I bet dude. you anything that he got Wallace off of a, a casting director of The Sopranos yeah. seeing him for that role. Like HBO yeah. was like notorious for kind of like recasting a lot of the Yeah, yeah over and, and over yeah. again. Yeah, sometimes, you know, that's a good thing and sometimes... I mean, how many times can we see Jeffrey Wright in a show? You know? <laughs> like, he's fine. I can see him a lot. He's fine. But after a while, I just like... I mean, he's, hey, hey. he's one of our greatest eyelid actors. He's a, he is a great him eyelid actor. Him and, uh, and uh, what's his name from uh, Homeland? Mandy Patinkin. Oh, yeah. I have world's great, greatest eyelid actor. I have a great Jeffrey Wright story that I cannot tell on the air. But when we get off the air, <laughs> damn it! When we get off the air, I'll tell it. Oh, Fair enough. Well, that's a tease for us, but not you, the listener. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy about it. So, I, I, I so hate- it was directed by uh, Lorraine Senna. Um, right. Who, uh, like you said, is the only female director that the Sopranos ever had. Right. And I feel bad for her because one of the things that stuck out at me about this episode mm-hmm. is that it, it feels poorly put together in a lot of ways. Like, it, like I, huh. it feels like this episode was good on paper. And then, like, a lot of things happen. Like, you realize that scene where Tony and his and his uh, team of delinquents steal the sacramental wine. Yeah. Like, that's a good storyline. Mm-hmm. But then you watch it play out and you realize that you have to have, like, child actors to p- yeah. pull, pull yeah. it off. Yeah. Child actors, like, I, I, having done a couple shows with kids, um, it's really, really, like... It's sort of one of those things where, like, you have to really want to tell a story with kids <laughs> yeah. to do it because you're like, is this worth it? Because they're always, they just, you know, it's 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 they're like, ask, yeah, exactly. It's like, would you ask a 15 year old to play in the major leagues? Yeah, like, they'd no. be yeah. really bad, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's the same thing as like you're asking them to be in like the major leagues of television, yeah. and they and they can't like hold their own. Like that throw up scene. 
In theory, yeah, that's a great scene. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Except, you can imagine reading that and be like, oh, this is great. Yeah, yeah, except it played like a bad episode of like Family Matters. Yeah, you know? Seventh Heaven or some shit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, uh, and I was, I talked to you guys about this like a couple weeks ago after I saw that movie Little, which like mm-hmm. it was big in reverse, right. which like, like sounds good on paper if you don't think about it for more than five minutes right. until you realize that you have to replace Regina Hall with Age. a young kid for the entire movie. <laughs> right. And then she has to try and she has to be like this 13 year old has to be the main character of the movie. And like imagine if you replace Tom Hanks in big. Yeah. But instead of like Tom Hanks just disappeared for most of the movie and then a little kid had to pretend to be Tom Hanks. Yeah. The whole time. Yeah. It's not going to work out well. Yeah. No. Unless you got Colin Hanks. <laughs> sure. I mean, that guy is almost as Can good as do Tom. no wrong. He or can. Chet Hanks. Or Chet, oh, I would love to see him just rapping all the lines. Mm, just, <laughs> the yeah. thing, the thing that struck me about this uh, episode specifically was that it was the like a, a lot of times in when we're working on something, we'll think like, is this a network story or is this a brought a cable kind of story? Mm-hmm. You know, like a network story. Usually, when we say that, it means like it's got a very like clear narrative that doesn't have a lot of subtext to it, and you kind of have to like hit the viewer over the head with the like metaphor like you know? the viewers there for that episode and they might have never seen the show before right and right. like you can feel the network notes being like are they gonna understand who that is mm-hmm. are they gonna understand this are yeah. they gonna understand that and i remember the first moment that that dawned on me watching this episode is when he's laying in bed and he's having that conversation with carmela and and he and we're seeing those like sharp cut-ins yes. of, yeah, of right. meadow yeah like you don't you don't need those no, right if no. you're even halfway intelligent you you know what his dilemma is you watched the previous episode yeah and, and he's kind of referencing it you get what he's saying through what he's saying it's the only time yeah. i think i've ever seen them try to do that kind of flashback yeah they don't before. they don't really do it after they that. try to stylize it I, maybe they hadn't invented the previously on yet maybe <laughs> yeah. that was like a new invention like a season later but right. they did not need to show that conversation again especially stylized it was yeah, like cut it was up. weird and also you have james gandolfini who is an incredible actor yeah. who definitely can pull off like how he's feeling without having to cut make those cuts and that, it was it was one of the only episodes of the show where i was like this feels like it got noted even right. though i'm mm. sure it didn't but mm-hmm. because i don't think david chase was like taking notes and hbo wasn't probably wasn't yeah. but it just it felt like that they, it's they're they're not quite confident in their place as like a prestige tv like they're not confident that people have seen the previous episodes yet yeah and i think back then you know that was a concern it's like maybe this is the first time somebody's tuning in to the sopranos mm-hmm. right you know and so you've, uh, it, because of tv watching habits were so different back then that was probably something that they kind of like felt like well fuck people aren't gonna know what's going on if we don't do this right yeah. So uh, even so, it was implied in the scene. They did yeah. not need to show it. It was it was a strange episode. It's also the only time I've ever seen, I think, an entire episode be half flashback. Mm-hmm. Which uh, I'm thankful they never did that again. Because once <laughs> right. again, you have to deal with uh, child actors. Yeah. And that kid apparently. Uh, who played young Tony Soprano? Bobby Boriello. Yes. No credits after 2004. Uh, do you know what his other uh, two uh, credits are? He was uh, I saw his young last... young Howard Stern in <laughs> a Private Parts. Yeah. No shit. Yeah, and he was uh, young Andy Kaufman in Man on the Moon. He plays a lot of young. <laughs> Famous person, right? That's uh-huh. that's his young bag. Jews and young He's Italians. He's young, like Russell Crowe, right? Like, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, um, and uh, yeah, and he has those like teeth where you know yeah, those, when you get the yeah. adult teeth and you've just gotten them. But you saw the little kid mouth. Yeah, yeah. 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 I had Gross. that real bad. Oh yeah, until I was like fourteen, probably. Mm-hmm. And then you beefed out, dude. Yeah. Look at your face now. Perfectly. Now symmetrical. my head seems small. No, that's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, still a big head. Yeah, uh, yeah, and then so so the the plot is they they steal the wine and mm-hmm. then the school thinks that AJ has ADD and I was really excited about this being an AJ episode because I love the AJ character but I feel like this episode soft pedals who AJ is mm-hmm. because before this. We really get the idea that AJ is the scumbag kid who fucking loves new metal, right? And uh, and you know, play. I mean, I guess you get a little bit of video games in this. He was yeah. a great kid character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he yeah, was yeah. really an outstanding, and that was the thing I think where Sopranos excelled, where other shows had never done before, was like they weren't afraid 
of anyone, even the kids, looking like scumbags. Right. Yeah. And yeah. I think of what you're saying about this being the show being like noted to death, uh, like the and being more networky than other Soprano shows. Like in previous shows, he'd be wearing like a, a Avenge Sevenfold T-shirt or something. Mm-hmm. And then this one, he just looks like little kid out of studio casting kind right. of thing. Yeah. He's just wearing like normal shirts, and he's got the like you don't know that he's the proto new metal head uh kid who's gonna eventually like get into yeah but niche. you get the idea that he's a little scumbag i mean it opens a with little, him yeah. stealing the sacrament like that's yeah. you know that he's uh obviously breaking rules and he's also uh you know they he, they were true to his character in the scene where he is being evaluated by a psychologist and he has to uh name what he sees uh, in the picture and he looks at a horse and then he just starts, you know, he's like, you mean because there's no guy? You mean you mean because maybe the guy's going out and getting food for the horse? And then he just out of nowhere mentioned South Park episode one. And, right, yeah. Which is like, of kids of that era, that is literally, oh, yeah. you, you talk to them for three minutes. They're eventually going to talk about South Park episode one where Cartman gets an anal probe. Right. Um, and then there's the whole ADD plot line. And uh, that, was, that, that was very... Like ripped from the headlines of the day. I feel. Definitely, yeah. I would have to say that we have to uh, open with our sting for it's the '90s because this has got a lot of '90s references. Yes, it's the '90s. Parents are supposed to discuss sex with their children. It's the '90s. It's, it's the '90s. '90s. So what we have in this episode in terms of '90s references? Number one, we've got ADD. Which mm-hmm. is everywhere. We, yeah. I had ADD. I, me too. You I was, have ADD. I was in the school psychologist, just like AJ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same Z's. What about you, ADD kid? No, really. No, I, I, I didn't like talk a lot. So uh. Nobody, <laughs> nobody. Uh, this is why you only got into writing and not stand up comedy. Apparently, yeah, I did. I didn't catch the bug. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, nobody thought I had ADD. People just were like, "You look weird." Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing is like, I think a lot of ADD kids like me and probably you too were just kids who were confused about the difference between positive and negative attention. Mm-hmm. Like, that's the one thing I noticed that anyone who was just like negative attention, positive attention, the point is people are looking at me like those kids a lot of the times were just medicated. Yeah. And I feel like I was one of those kids who was medicated for that very issue. I, I, I They told me to be on the medication and I didn't start until I was like in my 20s. They, ah. That medication was at the time was being thrown around for everything because i remember yeah. i had like this weird like twitchy like leg like restless leg thing yeah yeah and they were trying to give me add medication for it my dad who was a, a researcher was like he was like no what do, what do you what <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. for what what does it do like no for restless leg like, yeah for a fidget like get fucked He's it's not like they, they all had their new toy that they wanted to play with yeah they're like yeah let's try this one out so uh, remind me uh, I, I was thinking about this the other day uh, how often were you allowed to celebrate birthdays in your, in your family? I remember you saying like your dad only <laughs> didn't didn't give you a birthday party every year. No, we didn't have a birthday party every year. We, what we would usually like, I remember three birthday celebrations. Mm-hmm. I remember I had one when I was five, <laughs> and then I had another one when I was ten. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then I had another one when I was 13 mm-hmm. and then I don't, that's that's it. Was like, your thir- I mean I was it a bar, one, Was though. it a bar mitzvah? No, uh. Uh-uh. So oh okay, I thought maybe cuz that wouldn't count. And the one when I was 5, I remember I remember explicitly that it happened cuz my mom was like, "He's 5." Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, and I think partly it was like it wasn't my dad trying to be like punitive. Uh I think it was just he was just like I, I why like yeah. what's yeah. the purpose of doing that yeah uh, like he's, a big, we, he's a big boy now every year you're just a bigger boy but he can just say that excuse like I would get they would buy me something usually oh, but I nice. just wouldn't have a, a celebration a, no I wouldn't have so we wouldn't have the people over for like the bouncy house kind of thing that they do now. No, oh my god, yeah. Like I throw, I have two kids. I throw, we fucking break our backs throwing birthday parties for these kids yeah. every single year that they have a birthday. Yeah. And they like come to expect it, and yeah. I just want to be like, I never had that. Yeah, yeah. never had <laughs> yeah. anything that you're having. You went to a trampoline park. Oh yeah, no, I my girlfriend's uh, son turned six this past weekend. Did like the whole trampoline? Did you park. go to Sky Zone? 
Uh, no, it was in Fresno, but uh, uh, yeah, but the, we went to the, the version of that. Yeah, Fresno. the Fresno and I'm Sky like, Zone. Yeah. And I'm like, holy shit, this is amazing. I did, they did not have this one out. Like, I, it's cool to me now. Yeah. Well, I didn't get many birthday parties. I thought you were saying no presents or anything like that. I mean, no, my parents would, would always get they, me something. They got you something. Yeah. That's nice. I and mean, then they'd give my brother $5 to go get me something. <laughs> nice. And he would always get me something that was under 50 cents. Because <laughs> he's smart. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He knows Which how is to a, do it. A, an AJ move. <laughs> oh, totally. Like, yeah. It's definitely like when AJ buys his mom like a DVD of The Matrix. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have a clip of him getting uh, diagnosed with ADD here. Oh, go ahead. In many respects, Anthony is a normal, healthy eighth grader. Sister Patricia, his art teacher, thinks he shows strong skills and spatial orientation. But the thing is, though, and it's not just this one incident, Anthony sometimes has trouble following the rules, weighing consequences. At times, doesn't think before he acts. And it's thought that there's a good possibility Anthony could be ADD. ADD. I'm sorry, attention deficit disorder. I knew it. I always knew there was something. Well, what is it? It's an aggregate of symptoms. Inattention, impulsivity, sometimes, although not always, hyperactivity. Of course, to be sure, we'll need to give him a thorough evaluation. All he needs is a whack upside the head. If he's got an illness, it's an illness, right? You would hit somebody who's sick? You hit somebody with polio? <laughs> yeah. She, I, and I, I was just as... Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just say is like, I think Edie Falco didn't get the level of credit she deserved oh, for oh, this yeah. show because this episode, particularly a few of the beginning, like she carried a lot of these mm-hmm. early episodes because he what, what he was doing was great, but... Also, you'd seen a version of it, right? Like, we'd seen enough mob movies right. and The Godfather and, like, good portrayals of the mob that, like, we understood the universe that that character lived in. And, and this was definitely a different take, and he was amazing at it. But, we like, you you never really saw anybody do what Edie Falco was yeah. doing and the way that that character was written. Yeah. And especially in this episode. And that scene in particular, when I was watching it, it was like, she's a concerned, put-upon mom who and wife who like consistently goes to the line with her husband but like you can feel the character knowing there's a line she can't cross with right. him mm-hmm. and it's just like the level of skill that she has as an actress in this show is fucking amazing yeah i like she has to be she's sort of the new way new age like she's trying to be a modern mom mm-hmm. but she's also you know she's still a jersey chick who married like a mobster and like the way that she balances those two things is amazing and she does it like throughout the entire throughout the entire show yeah and what's interesting about that scene with her is that she starts off as soon as he gives the diagnosis it's I knew it. Yeah, it yeah. It's it's this idea that because and this recurs throughout the series that like there's got to be something medically wrong with everyone in her family, yeah. uh, whether it's genetics or mm-hmm. just some sort of learning disorder, because like she herself has she puts a lot of emphasis on genetics and she complains about the fact that every time AJ is sad or whatnot, that this is just some soprano gene that right uh, well it's this like total yeah. inability and it was the character this total inability to face the reality right. of the I'm, life that she's exactly. chosen exactly and the know? situation her kids are in <laughs> like yeah like this idea like i knew it had to be medical it has nothing to do with the fact that my husband is the literal head of the new jersey mafia <laughs> yeah <laughs> and i and i love the the add diagnosis scene because i remember like doing those sort of tests oh, when yeah. I was around that age mm-hmm. where they'd be like, uh, are, do you ever fidget? Are you ever yeah. like impulsive? Uh, I cried. Do, you ever, do you ever talk out of turn? And I was like, well, yeah. yeah. Like, doesn't everybody do that? Like, I cried during mine. <laughs> yeah. Because they just kept pushing on the things that I did. And I didn't know if I did all of them, but I knew I did something wrong. <laughs> and then just at some point I started crying and they're like, he's got it. He's got the ADD. Yeah. Like, we broke it. He's got it. <laughs> exactly. And I didn't get the ADD meds, but about like five years before that, like I had I had an asthma attack when I was like five, yeah. uh, you know, because I grew up in Fresno uh, where the air's bad. And right, right, right. Uh, they gave 
kids these things called Theodore Sprinkles, which I guess what? similar to uh, ADD, they don't like they got a lawsuit and they don't give it to kids anymore. Theodore it's basically Sprinkles? like it's basically like speed. Like they, they were just doling out speed. They called to the little it kids. Theodore Sprinkles, oh, yeah, though. Yep, yep. Was that the street name or was <laughs> it? It was, like, it was Teddy Sprinkles. <laughs> is it Pfizer? And it's actually named after the guy who <laughs> invented it, Doctor Doctor Sprinkles. Dr. Thank Theodore you very much. Sprinkles. Uh, yeah. His name was actually Stephen Sprinkles. <laughs> <laughs> he wanted this to sound more upscale. Um, but yeah, yeah. and yeah. then so when you're talking about mob, uh, the, another things that another thing that I noticed like in one of the first scenes, we get very little Christopher in this episode. Right. But we do get a snippet at the beginning yes. where he has to show up to his no show construction job, mm-hmm. and I feel like the Sopranos showed the sort of the the way that the mob actually works yes. in a much like deeper, much more specific uh, way than any other mob thing. Yeah. Ever it done. was not afraid to show the like mundane nature of right. many aspects of the mob. Mm-hmm. Just yeah. like like the wire would always show police work and people like yeah. filling out paperwork right. in <laughs> sort of the day to day non exciting and yeah. and that became kind of like the stew in which the show lived mm-hmm. and, and you liked it once you were in it. Yeah. Um, that w- the, the Sopranos was so good at that. It just yeah, like the, filled with the ticky tack little paydays that have, they were yeah, all involved. I have like when he, when he steals the the the, the bracelets, right? And he yeah. brings them in. Yeah, he's like, I stole these off a FedEx truck just because he could. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I I got the scene where they they've shut down. They they they've used their union to like shut down this uh, construction site mm-hmm. uh, in order to get a kickback. Which I actually like. I watched it the first time. And I didn't understand what was happening. Right. And I usually watch these episodes like twice before we do the sh- do the show. And mm. I finally understood what was happening uh, in the second the second time I watched it. But I got that clip. You're doing an excellent job. Allow yourself to take pleasure in that. Guy's been ragging in my fucking ear all day. I'd like to kill the prick. You hear that, prick? Get him out. Of here. Just get him the hell out of here. Is there a problem? Look, you made your point, okay? I made my point. You made your point. What point is that? Enough with this work stoppage. This is a union safety official, and he stays until the union deems this workplace is free of hazard. I have the money. You do? Oh, Christopher, uh, give the union a call and see if this gentleman here has paid up his union dues and then pop on these wheel covers. We'll check the brake pads. I'll get right on it. I still don't understand the thing with the brake pads, okay. but I get the rest That was of just it. like the the cover sure right yeah. exactly i it, the, my guess is that the brake pads is saying that like he's the union safety inspector right and and he will not pass them on a safety inspection until they get the money which right. means he won't even look at the brake pads until he gets the money that's my guess it was either yeah. that or it was a threat and i'm no, not no, sure no, no. i yeah. think it was the fir- former yeah. It, it, yeah it's just like so much of this like these like lame shakedowns <laughs> right you know yeah. that that it, it had never really been done before. Right. Like you hadn't really ever seen that version of it. Yeah, but it was like, always cool. All e- mob movies had shakedowns that were just awesome, like just beating the shit out of someone for yeah. some money. And like there would be violence Which involved. is usually what it is, I think. Like usually well, it's more just like... Yeah, no, but, but this- I, it is going making your rounds to the different people that you are, you know, offering, quote, protection to. Mm-hmm. And just like, thanks for my envelope, and on to the next one. Yeah. Everyone hated doing pickups on the show because it was the most boring part of the job. <laughs> yeah. The only thing they liked is when someone was light with an envelope, then they got to be violent. But I like in this one that Tony uses his job interview voice for, for like this part. <laughs> You know, like, Does he? yeah, oh, very much. I'll get your money, okay? We shall return. Oh, yeah. <laughs> fucking Lulia. I mean, the part with the brake pads is like, yeah. oh, he's this is just gentleman is a union official. Yeah, <laughs> we shall return. His, it's like his yeah. voice when he's like, oh, no, this is just a, an unfair stereotype of Italian American. <laughs> yeah, right. the, the other thing I really liked about because because this idea of a mob boss not wanting his kid to sort of turn out the way that he did. I mean, that's like, that's from, you know, the, the tale as old as time, right? Mm-hmm. Like it is the thesis statement of the Godfather, you know? Right. Um, but the thing that I liked about this episode that I did think w- was a twist on it was like, it, it wasn't so much Tony worried about him getting into the mafia, mm-hmm. you know? It, it became more about Tony just worrying about having a piece of shit kid right yeah exactly oh, and, and and like in most mafia movies the idea is that you don't want your kid to grow up into a life of crime in the sopranos it's a little bit more complex because it's all the growing pains of when you move up in social class right it's like you know tony's got this sort of working class 
uh, upbringing, and now he's raising his kid like in a rich suburb right. around rich people who he doesn't really understand, right. and he's raising these kids that are kind of growing up around uh, spoiled rich kids, right, which yeah. has like a whole separate uh, you know series of problems. Right, it's like the resentment for he, he, that he has for his kid is not just that like oh in my day we did things different, but he's like re- he's raising like a sissy. He's yeah. raising a little complainy, fucking just fat douchey mm-hmm. kid. Gotta see a psychologist. Yeah, at the exactly. School. It's like all the things that he thinks are weak. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly, exactly. Which just makes me love their interactions more and more because he, you know, he he wants to be sweet with him, uh, but he also is just barely always on the edge of violence with him. Yeah. Because he's just yeah. like, if I could just beat the shit out of him, then he would finally be tough. And, like, and, that's the one thing he just wants and he just never gets on the show. It, it's, it's, the Sopranos, I think, like, largely was kind of an examination of weakness. Yeah. Like, yes. what it is, what it looks like, the different forms of it. Like, is it a subjective thing or yeah. not? Like, because there's so many times, like... Even just a mobster, the idea of a mobster going to a therapist, right? Like, Tony is like, is this weakness that yeah. I'm here? It's like the feelings that she gets out of him, like him feeling feelings. Is that weakness? Is right. my kid, like, I love my kid, but I want to kick the shit out of him because yeah. I, like, they they really dug in. I feel like the the writers really, like, dug into the idea of, like, we're not going to Ha- find a clean answer to this it's going to constantly be this push and pull through the series mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um and and that's why i think the kid characters in this show especially aj are so alive in like a way that they just aren't in other shows you yeah know? like that because that's as a parent my your kids you can't help it your kids are constantly, you feel like they're a reflection of you. Right. You see them do things that, yeah. like the things that make me maddest that my kids do are things that I used to do mm-hmm. yeah. and that I hated about myself oh, or, yeah. or I currently hate about myself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then I see them do it and I, and I go fucking ballistic <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I'm just, I'm getting mad at myself. You're trying to but beat I'm the d- weakness out of yourself. Right, yeah. exactly, yeah. exactly. Venture X from Capital One is the travel card for people always asking, where next? You earn 10x miles on hotels and rental cars and 5x miles on flights booked through Capital One Travel and 2x miles on everything else you buy with Venture X. Plus, receive premium travel benefits like access to over 1,300 airport lounges. The Venture X card from Capital One. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. See CapitalOne.com for details. Yeah, um, and then so so the after uh, the ADD, uh, part of his AJ's punishment is to go uh, hang out with Livia. Yeah, which is which is great because yes. like she doesn't really want it either. Yeah, yeah. So the best grandma I think who's ever been on a TV oh, show. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, before we get into that, I want to get to just real quick the punishment that was doled out by uh, Carmela. Yes. At the dinner table. And by the way, like this is another example of where I think the direction of the show was kind of bad. Mm. Like I don't like they couldn't get a clean take. Of AJ being uh, uh, being sad about this oh. punishment, oh, so, so they, they have these the weird. Tear? They have these weird like cuts to the close up of the tear, like yeah. two weird close ups. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Anyway, well, it's a problem with child actors, yeah. you know. But uh, this was the punishment which I related to wholeheartedly. You are not to play Mario Kart or go skateboarding for three weeks, and no TV. No. And you are not going to sit on that internet either. Like, in terms of a 90s <laughs> punishment for a child, you can't get more, like, no. in that zone. I mean, yeah. number one, uh, no Mario Kart, which already, <laughs> like, do you think someone told Edie Falco, remember to pronounce it Mario? Or you think she just knew this is exactly how a new I bet Jersey... you anything that she just, that was a choice she oh, made. Oh, I love it. It's so good. It's so good. And uh, and yeah, and then <laughs> no, no skateboarding, no Mario Kart, and no... An, Sitting around on that internet. No being on that <laughs> internet either. Just... Mwah. And also, uh, no TV, which is the ultimate punishment yeah. as a child. Now, when I was a kid, uh, we got bad grades. And they took the TVs out of our house. We didn't have Ooh, TV. That's a nuclear option. Yeah, yeah. So from sixth grade uh, for, uh, I mean, actually from like fifth grade on to 11th grade, no TV in the house during the school year. And we got the TVs wow. back 
September 11th, 2001. Because <laughs> September 11th happened, they put the TVs He's back. Like, you want you? I'm going to force you to watch this. <laughs> yeah, you have to see what we've done. No, and uh, and yeah, they put the TVs back in the house. And you know there was so all this... you have this really fond memory of September. <laughs> so <remember> it was <laughs> a pretty good day in the Lee yeah. household. <laughs> One of the things I've realized as an adult is that all of the punishments that my all of those kinds of punishments yeah. against me as a kid are just as much punishments for the parents. Yeah, like when you take away your kid's oh. TV, it's like oh now you have to like Dude, talk to your kid and hang out with them. Pun- oh. Punishing your kid is the worst thing in the world. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. like like for instance like like the other day my kid we were having this back and forth. And he, I told him to put on his clothes like twenty fucking times, and then finally I was like, "All right, well, we're not going to go out to lunch then. Like, yeah. I want to go out to lunch. Yeah, 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 <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. And now I have to sit at home with my fucking kid, who's like now pissed off yeah. and upset, and is like really upset at me. And instead, so it's way worse for me than yeah. it is for him. And it's, it's so transparent. It literally does hurt you more than it hurts him. Yes. That's amazing. And it's so transparent at that age that they just don't have the capacity to deal with disappointments. Yeah. So you'll be like, put on that shirt. And then they'll just start wailing because they'll just be like, yeah. Oh, like just any anything yeah. can set them off and they're, yeah. they're yeah they're crying and then they're like okay like 45 seconds later yeah 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 what, at what age are we talking that's my six-year-old yeah yeah my yeah. three-year-old is like literally anything if he it, he just gets in moods where he wants to be mad and yeah so you'll just be like he would be like you get dressed and he's like i don't want to get dressed and i'll be like okay and he'll be like i want to get <laughs> like he just yeah. wants to get mad about something yeah um so aj goes to visit livia yeah. and he reveals to her that uh that uh, that tony is going to see a psychiatrist yeah and they have a weird back and forth that's almost like a lonely island sketch because they just keep going back and yeah. forth like over and over and over again and yeah it was yeah uh yeah and then she has a very good line in that so i got a clip of that mm-hmm think so, Brad. I'm kind of wiped. Oh, you're a 13-year-old boy. You're too young to be so tired. They sent me to a psychiatrist all morning. I took like a million tests. A psychiatrist? <laughs> yeah, you know, because I got suspended and everything. They sent you to a psychiatrist? Yeah. But that's crazy. That's all nonsense. That's nothing but a, a racket for the Jews. <laughs> Dad goes. He does not. Yes, he does. Uh, he does not. Yes, he does. To a psychiatrist? Yeah. He does not. <laughs> he does too. But why do you say that that's ridiculous? Because it's true. I heard him and Mom talking about it. What does he need a psychiatrist for? Is it okay if I take that pair, Grandma? So great. That is that nobody landed conversations that old Italians have. Oh, yeah, that, like half my family's Italian. I know you're Italian. Like, yeah, those are the most Italian conversations <laughs> oh. you. She's ever my had. grandma. Just that weird broken record where you have to say the same thing like uh, seventeen times. Yeah. No, it's not. Yeah. No, it's true. No. A psychiatrist? Yeah, Your psychiatrist. father would never. He did. He would. He did not. And by the way, every Italian parent, they're like, if you tell them you're in therapy, it's they take it so insanely personal. <laughs> like, yeah. well, I guess I just did everything I could, and I guess it wasn't enough. Yeah. Oh, the martyr gene is always yeah. so strong with them. I guess I. I guess everything that I did for you. <laughs> wasn't enough yeah you're like no no i just i'm just going to therapy because i'm working on <laughs> working on some things so everything that my father your father and i did it wasn't enough <laughs> yeah uh my other favorite like super italian moment is when tony's trying to imagine uh like a different life for himself or his kids mm-hmm. and like the, the 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 alternate existence that he comes up with uh i'll play that for you it's really good Do you think that's how your son feels about you? Yeah, probably. And I'm glad. I'm glad if he's proud of me. But that's the bind I'm in, because I don't want him to be like me. He could be... Which is like the nut of the show. Uh Right. He could be anything he wants to be. He could be like um, this guy I know in high school. His grandfather invented these little ties that go on the end of salamis. He made millions of dollars. (laughs) He's sitting on his ass. (laughs) 
<laughs> that he is could also, be anything. He could be like a salami millionaire. That is the other super. Like they, every clearly everyone on that writing staff knew lots and lots of Italians uh-huh. because that is the most. Like every Italian's dream is to. <laughs> Every Italian's dream is to invent something that takes almost no brain power to invent <laughs> a food thing, a food thing, and then make millions from it. Yeah, and not it's do like, anything after and that. Sit yeah, on your exactly. Ass. Yeah. He invented that's... the casing for Mustacho, and now he's a millionaire. Like that's like every fucking like. I, every time I would go, uh, all my Italian family lived in Joliet, mm-hmm. which is like right, a shithole right outside mm-hmm. of Chicago. And when we'd go visit them, they'd always be like. They would always do two things. One, they would like praise me for how much I ate. Yeah, oh, and, God, I love and they that. would and they would complain about black people doing <laughs> doing just normal things, the exact things that they, they do. Yeah, they'd be like, "This Moon Johnny, he's walking down the street. It's like, what are you doing?" <laughs> I'm like, even even at even at like eight years old, I knew I'm like. You just said somebody's walking down the street <laughs> and you have a problem with this. Moon Johnny goes to the store, he buys two things, he fucking leaves. And you're like, what, what, what do you yeah. want him to do? Yeah, that's why I was always like the prince to my grandma. Because like, yeah. however, anytime that she would offer me more food, I would take it and eat it. And oh. I would be like the fucking king of the world. Yeah, yeah. Like, he is such, they say to my mom, they'd be like, Johnny, he is such a good eater. <laughs> I just, I just, there's no, anything I put on his plate, he eats. That boy. <laughs> He's going to be something. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> That's the best thing you could ever be in your grandparents' eyes is oh, a good eater. yeah. No, and then, for sure. So, like, the mafia is basically that salami dream applied somewhere else. It's right. Like their entire goal is to have these no-show jobs and just, like, sit at the bank yeah, all day. Yeah, sitting on your ass is, like, that is peak. If you can do that, then you're living your life correctly. Yeah. It's- I would love to, like, see do a deep dive into the writing staff of the sopranos because the one thing about that show that had never really been done because like previous to that i think like oz was kind of the first thing to like break but oz didn't have like a lot of humor to Mm -hmm. it you know there was a little bit here and there some dark stuff but like for the most part it didn't but the sopranos had tons of comedy yeah like tons of comedy and it was one of the only shows it was like with the first drama to really like do that Mm -hmm. you know uh it was almost like a sitcom before it was a drama right yeah and and it, it that ta- it, and it has like really like skilled comedic beats in it, and I just like I wonder on that writing staff like who went on to like who either had worked in comedy or you know because it clearly somebody I mean yeah. it was mm-hmm. it was a funny show. I love hearing my friends' stories of like living in Italy where like nothing works quite right because everybody like kind of half asses their job and it's yeah. just ex- an accepted thing. Where right. it's like like here you're worried about getting your car towed, and there it's just like. Ah, yeah, you park there, maybe. Probably it'll be fine. Right. And you're like, are, sh- are you sure? And like, ah! <laughs> yeah. They probably, get, probably won't get a ticket. Nah, don't worry about it. You know? And then yeah. it's like, oh, uh, when's the bus going to show up? I don't know. The bus driver, he's off to the bus. It'll be here when it's here. Yeah. yeah. I remember once when I was traveling in Europe, I was in, uh, when I was like 20, I was backpacking and I was in Rome and it was the first time I had been in Italy since I had like visited, I had family in Italy but and I visited when I was like three but I didn't remember. So I was there back when I was 20 and I remember being super disappointed by the food, right? Like everywhere I went, I was like, this food is not, because I didn't have any money, so I couldn't Mm -hmm. go to like nice places. But I went to like, you know, regular places where if you went in the US, you'd probably get a decent meal. Right. And I said to this Italian guy we were traveling with, I was like, this food is shitty. And he's like, it's it's as good as it needs to be. (laughs) And and I was like, oh yeah, he's right, because I have to buy it and nobody like tries. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Nobody has these like, grand designs to like have a chain of really good restaurants mm-hmm. and you know they yeah. just was like it's as good as it needs to be <laughs> right you paid for it you ate it yeah you ate it you piece of shit <laughs> yeah. there's probably like a different chef for like the tourist like, he's not gonna come back <laughs> yeah um yeah so a couple of uh gaba gaba a few yeah there was uh, what did you have um well i have one i have uh ubats yeah so we got a we got an explanation from stevie we B. got a stevie b ubats? we got a, we got an ubats beautiful Hey, how you doing? Hey, I'm Stevie B, and the Italian American slang word of the day is Ubats. Ubats! I'm heading to the Sala Maria to order a sandwich for lunch. As I'm <laughs> walking down the street, I see down the block Donnie chasing after his wife Lucia. They're screaming at each other, carrying on right there in broad daylight. 
right in broad daylight. The two of them, down the block, Donnie and his wife, they're both do bots. Medigan. <laughs> As I head to the delicatessen to order lunch on the boulevard are down the block Donald and his wife. They are in a very heated, very loud, very public discussion. As I witness the action displayed in public, I realize that down the block Donald and his wife are both crazy. Ooh, bots! Mm. <laughs> Thank you, Stevie B, yeah. for everything that you do. I, I, is this channel endless? Because I really oh. hope it is. I, like, I looked up the two things that I heard in this episode, and he had both of them. Oh, that's beautiful. What's the second one that you uh, heard? Well, Mama Luke. Ah. Which has a, like, a, a rich uh, a rich etymological history. I believe it was like a slave, uh -huh. an Islamic slave slave in, yeah. in in the time of the Moors. Yeah, and later a really, really big dog. <laughs> Ma a mama duke <laughs> that's a marmaduke joke everyone mm. oh i got it that oh was, thank yeah you, you. Did, you did great and i remember hearing mama luke growing up I, and i was like never really knew what it meant exactly yeah that's why we got stevie b thank you that. stevie b let's do it how you doing i'm stevie b <laughs> the italian american slang word of the day is mama luke mama luke so Stevie B's sitting in what looks like his office, and he's got a framed picture of, uh, I don't know if that's Tony Bennett or <laughs> Louis Prima on the wall behind him, but he's got, he's got someone back there. Medium Petey comes into my office, tells me he's been watching all reruns of Star Trek, goes, it's good for little Petey. I go, good for little Petey? He goes, yeah. Tessie told me I should read the book Dr. Spock wrote on Raising a Kid. He goes, so I figure I'd just watch the Star Trek instead. Sometimes, Edie and Petey, he's a real Mama Luke. A Medigan. My cousin Peter sat in my office and explained to me he's been watching a lot of reruns of Star Trek because it's good for his newborn son, Peter Jr. When I question this method, he tells me his wife Teresa told him he should read the book Dr. Spock wrote on rearing a child. He said to me, although I enjoy watching Star Trek, I don't know how it pertains to child rearing. Sometimes, Peter can be quite an idiot. Mama Luke. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. I feel like, and tell me if I'm wrong, Italians have maybe a thousand words for idiot. <laughs> yeah. Just like... Uh, I mean, is that is that unique to them, though? So do we. Yeah. I mean, I guess so, but I, it feels like every other time we do Stevie B, it's just another way of calling some guy a fucking idiot. Sure. Yeah. But I think what happens with uh, words for idiots is, uh, you know, it starts as a medical term, idiot, moron, uh -huh. retard, and right. then eventually we just, like, we use it as an insult enough right. that they're like, well, this is right, insensitive. We gotta, yeah, we, we gotta, gotta come up with a new one, and then yeah. that becomes an insult, and then the whole process starts over yeah. again. Yeah, that's, a, yeah, that's an interesting way of looking at it. I thought it was just like, you know, there's just a lot of idiots in Italy, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And just like the way Italians or uh, Eskimos have a thousand words for snow, you know? <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and then we got uh, malapropisms this episode. Oh, yeah. I only got one that I found. Oh, I found two. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, got the, I got the albatross. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The albacore around my neck. Do you have a clip of that? Oh, I do. Get up and we get a little cash flow going. Oh, I mean... Mr. Cash Flow, big businessman now. Well, what do you know about it? You're scared of your own shadow. Reno is growing by leaps and bounds, <sighs> Livia. It's a chance to get in on the ground floor. After Rocco gets the book up, he's going to open a new supper club. He wants me to run it. A supper club? Are you drunk? Oh, Perlamon, on the Jesus Christ on my fucking albacore around my neck. Every... <laughs> which is Which is great. But also, we've got genetical. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so that's uh, when Tony is asking about the ADD. Mm -hmm. uh, that yeah, it's, it's genetical. Yeah, it, maybe it's genetical, which is a, a big worry in the Soprano family, especially for Tony, that he's spreading his shitty genes to his kid. Yeah. So two things about the albacore sequence. Uh -huh. uh, another example of a weird, bad direction in this movie, uh -huh. or in this episode, uh, it just felt like the ADR was pretty bad. Like the... 
Like a lot of it didn't match up in that scene. Uh, I didn't. And there's that another one. scene where Tony's talking about Jefferson Airplane, and it's like an overhead shot, and his oh, lips yeah. are clearly yeah. not moving. Right. And they clearly added it in later, maybe because they couldn't figure out which song they were going to use, mm. and they didn't know which one they were going to get the rights to, so they had to put it in afterwards, mm-hmm. I guess. Huh. Uh, so yeah. There's a yeah. It just felt it felt w- more poorly made than a lot of hey, the other listen, episodes. A lot of these early episodes have mistakes like that. There's uh, I think there's a bunch of modern cars in the in the scenes back in the '60s when they're kids, like in, parked in the background. Mm-hmm. There's like modern like oh really? I didn't yeah, see it's that. not it's not perfect. Yeah, but you know, I mean, it's a lot of work for a flashback sequence. To... It's it's a lot of work for a flashback sequence, especially for a show like that where you have no idea whether or not anyone's gonna like the show why mm-hmm. put in 100 percent effort you know yeah. it's the italian way <laughs> you gotta go halfway with it it yeah. just turned out that it was a worthy enterprise yeah that's all and then my other thing was just trying to imagine if uh tony's dad had moved to reno and what if like the sopranos was set in reno and he was like the crime boss of reno nevada yeah i mean that's an interesting show too <laughs> especially given how shitty of a town reno is it's it's almost kind of like New Jersey in that same way. Yeah. But, like, is the crime boss of Reno any smaller than the crime boss of New Jersey? I don't I don't know. I think one, one of the things that I think the, the cultural effect of this show yeah. was and why setting it in Reno might not have had that effect is, is I think setting it in, in Reno or any, like, place like that makes it suddenly feel like it's like it's like setting something on another planet you know right. like no nobody lives in a it's, place like that it's beverly hillbilly right so, right yeah. and and i think like one of the things that that happened in this sh- in this show that i think you see sometimes like this also happens like wolf of wall street like i remember he- seeing a lot of people's reactions to wolf of wall street be like oh that looks like an awesome life yeah <laughs> like, right i yeah. saw right, jordan right. belfort and they were like that's that guy's cool that guy's cool yeah, yeah. and the point of the movie was supposed to be like what a pathetic like human being this is right um and i think with this like you you definitely started to see like dudes who were just like you know middle managers at like a company be like and this fucking guy like like (laughs) non-account like they just like like yeah i'll fucking take care of him like saying shit like you know like everybody's 45 year old dad who (laughs) watched the show (laughs) thought that they were in the bada bing (laughs) right and they like craved that like place yeah. you know and and in reality it's like such a depressing yeah sad lone like they're in this they're they're in this shitty back room of yeah. a strip club bunch of morbidly one, obese man like one pool, pool table like <laughs> yeah. it just sucks so bad and everybody who's every like dad whose life didn't go exactly how he wanted right. to was watching that being like yeah, hey, yeah. fuck that's Look at that's these the cool dream guys. yeah he's it's drinking that show about the cool guys he's drinking yeah. grappa at 10 in the morning yeah, yeah. and it's like it, it's such a litmus test. Yeah, yeah. I think if you look at that and you go, "Oh, this is a show about just a bunch of dudes living the dream," yeah. then you don't really get the show. At least, but I mean, it speaks to the strength of the show that you can, uh, you can like the show either way. Yeah, yeah. You people can... can watch The Sopranos and think it's a bunch of cool guys, and it's still a good show to them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, let them believe that. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, one thing we haven't talked about uh, with this episode is that uh, the entire flashback sequence. Yeah is basically the jumping off point for the Sopranos movie that they're making. Yeah, right. Cause Wait, it, they are making... Oh, yeah, the, 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 the prequel. prequel. Yeah. They're making a young Tony, played yeah. by James Gandolfini's son, who uh-huh. like is witnessing the the riots uh-huh. in Newark, which they sort of reference right, right. in this episode. Right. And, you know, all the like Ed Sullivan stuff. And David Chase clearly has like a, a sort of a thing for that whole time period. He made that... I forget what it was called. He made a whole movie where it was like a kid so what growing is it? up in... 68? 69? Um, I think it's 67 because they mentioned 67. the, the right. Democratic Convention at one point, right? Was that in 67? That was 67. Yeah. That sounds the, the, right. In Detroit where right. they had the riot. It's not a series. It's just a movie. Just it's just a, a movie. movie. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting time period, you know, given, you know, the kind of the cultural forces that were behind the scenes happening and yet this you know yeah newark riot 67 also 67 yeah so it and and this neighborhood trying to like stay the same and kind of like keep that you know because there's this whole kind of like anti-counterculture thing with with a lot of like the italian 
mafiosos. Mm-hmm. Like they they hate hippies, but they never talk about. You, you know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah. I'm interested to see how how that plays out, just in the in the show, whether or not because uh, I feel like Tony uh, has all these different paths that he could have taken, and I want to see those like unfold before him like yeah, could I mean, he have gone could he have been those guys one of those dudes who like toured with the dead you know <laughs> like i want to see where he would have gone had he not been forced into that life yeah i think like it, and it's also interesting like you know godfather 2 being a good example of this yeah. of like the prequel that is kind of the almost like you're watching a rube goldberg machine yeah like show you how this thing ended in this place that you now are know it as yeah. you know and i think those to me those are my favorite prequels are the ones that get you know where it's going but the mm-hmm. whole journey is pretty unexpected right like i think that's if you're doing a prequel that's what i think you have to pull off is everyone knows where it's going so how do you surprise people and well, it, with how they got there. Well, if it's a superhero movie, the big climax scene is where they put on the outfit that you know them from. Yeah, yeah. Or like shave their beard off. Yeah. yeah. Like, now he looks like the thing from yeah, yeah. the comics. I yeah. know. That's why, like, there's this one bat- run of Batman comics called Batman Year One, mm-hmm. which is just basically the first year Batman was Batman. Yeah. And and they do a smart thing, which is that it's not. It doesn't end like that. It starts with him putting on the the costume mm-hmm. i mean it, there's a little bit of time between but but it's mostly about like how much you fuck up as batman right. your first year yeah uh and i think like it, it it does he like accidentally kill a bunch of people <laughs> i can't remember that would be pretty really sick. i don't think so okay <laughs> Uh, Batman tends not to do that. Right, but, I know, um, but it was his first year. You know, although Zack Snyder bucks. says, grow the fuck up, Batman <laughs> kills people. Is yeah. that what Zack Snyder says? Yep, Jesus it is. Christ. Uh, which I, I loved. I loved. Like, <laughs> you you got to retell the story about the Flex magazine. Oh, well, yeah. So Chris Maloney, who I worked with on a show, he's actually on this Harley Quinn show, too. He plays Commissioner Gordon. He's oh, nice. Fucking, he's amazing. Um, is Chris Maloney's on set of Superman. Uh, and there, everybody's crowded around Zack Snyder at Video Village, and so Maloney goes behind to see what everybody's looking at, and Maloney and Zack Snyder's like on his iPad, and he's like swiping on these picture after picture of these like insanely huge bodybuilders, uh-huh. like just like the biggest dudes you've ever seen, like oiled up, and mm-hmm. and he's like looking through them for some reason, and this <laughs> then this woman who is like I think she's a producer on the film or something, but she just goes, ugh, that is disgusting. And Zack Snyder goes, yeah, disgustingly awesome. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's amazing. Say what you will about Zack Snyder, but he he, is who he is. He has an idea of what he wants to make, and he makes it. (laughs) I would love to see the Snyder cut of The Sopranos. Yeah. (laughs) Release The Sopranos Snyder cut. (laughs) Isn't it amazing how every time WB. Official Twitter page tweets anything. All of the responses are just release the Snyder cut. <laughs> I haven't uh, followed that. But you, I... you have to see it. Like, just go to any tweet that <laughs> WB's. Just it'll be just like, hey, we're releasing this Harry Potter thing, and just everything below is like, release the Snyder cut, release the Snyder. Cut. Like thousands. It's like just... sixty nine, and people yeah, say nice. nice. Yes, yeah. it's like that. Nice. Um, yeah. So then this episode ends uh, with. Tony working out in his basement, which is hilarious, the idea of, of him exercising. Because mm-hmm. like, I think that's part of their whole dream is to never exercise. But then, of course, he immediately follows it up by making uh, ice cream sundaes and eating the whipped cream out of the, out of the, right. out of the canister. With, and trying to pour it down uh, AJ's neck, which is, as far as I know, the only reference to the title down neck oh yeah any idea what that uh, means yeah no no, no. not not really no idea i was just like oh he tried to pour it down his neck there's probably a reason and i bet we could research it but like why yeah you know doesn't say oh down neck refers to the iron bound section of newark new jersey where tony grew up oh all right there you go okay well, that's weird that you made that connection from the whipped cream. I was just tr- spending the whole time trying to understand why it was called down neck. They sure. didn't mention it at all. There was, uh, yeah, they, I had no idea. Um, yeah, I, that all to all together, I would say that is, uh, you know, probably one of the best episodes of The Sopranos this season. <laughs> really? Personally, yes. No and way. I'll tell you why. Uh, because it was for me, it was Livia's 
coming out party yeah. in terms of like she, she yeah she's so fucking funny and so good in this episode and not only that even flashback Livia is amazing I mean she you've got her wanting to stick a fork right in his eye uh, you've got her mentioning the fact that she would rather smother her kids <laughs> with a pillow yeah. than take them to to Reno. To, to Reno which is just fantastic and also an allusion to something that happens later in the season but we won't mm-hmm. get into it because mm-hmm. there's no spoilers on this I definitely yeah. think it's one of the better written episodes I don't think it quite made it to uh, well, think about, made well, it to the the final cut as the I episode mean, I think that it could have been so far it's college in this one to me uh, the pilot though the pilot's great yeah, pilots. Good. Yeah, sure. College yeah. is, I think, the best first season episode, and maybe one of the best episodes. Oh yeah, all time. Oh yeah. yeah, 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 for sure. But second best, I'm saying Down Neck. All right. I liked it a lot. All right. Yeah. Um. And yeah, and I think that's it. Justin, thank you so much for thanks coming for on. having me. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Uh, where can we find you on on the internet? Uh, well, my Twitter is at Justin underscore Halpern. Nice. Mm-hmm. Does someone have at Justin Halpern? Yeah, and they, they only have one tweet up, and the tweet says, Yay, I have a Twitter page just like my daddy now. <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. It's something like that. I mean, maybe how it's many gone years? Right now. Yeah, that's the thing. You need to check because you might be able to switch over. Oh, maybe so now. I'm yeah, not sure. Yeah, it's a thing. You can, like, if, like, if someone doesn't use their page after a while, you can take the name. Oh, oh. Mm. we did get an email. Oh, we got a Sopranos email. Yeah. Hey, Godfrauders slash Podfathers. New email, old listener. My girlfriend and I just finished The Sopranos for the first time last week and thoroughly enjoyed it. Half the reason we finally got around to it was because of Pod Yourself a Gun. The new podcast is great so far. Here are two bumpers I put together for the phone slash email segment. Version two is just the voicemail. Version three is email and voicemail. Uh, Blah, 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 blah. Lieb, audacity is a hell of a drug. Yes, it is. Hello. Hey. Who's this? Pod yourself a gun. On the what? Leave a voicemail. At no. The Google voice number? 415-275-0030. Yeah, I'll give it a fucking message. <laughs> fucking goddamn fucking... <laughs> God damn it, Tony! <laughs> That's pretty good. Really well done. <laughs> Very well done. Let's hear the next one. Hello? Hey. Who's this? Pod yourself a gun. On the what? Email us if you have any questions. <laughs> That's broadcast at gmail.com. No. Uh, Vince, what's a Google voice number? 415-275-0030. Yeah, I'll give it a fucking message. <laughs> fucking goddamn <laughs> fucking... <laughs> That's fantastic. Damn it, Tony! That's fantastic. That's very good. That yeah. person is very talented. You're very, very good at audacity. Uh, I mean, as bumpers, they're, they're they're quite long. I mean, I <laughs> I think we would have to use the combination voicemail email one because <laughs> yeah. there's no way we're doing that twice. <coughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Thank you so much for for the bumpers, and uh, thank you for listening. And uh, yeah, once again. That uh, email is fraudcast at gmail.com, which is our other podcast. Uh, Vince, what is the Google Voice number? Uh, 415-275-0030. Did you not hear it in the bumper? Yeah, they probably did. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks so much for listening. And until next time, uh, don't, don't stop, stop believing. believing. <laughs>